So Jonathan, I want you to picture the scene. Mm -hmm. You're walking into a busy cafe and the waiter comes over and sits you down by the wall. Yeah. You order a cappuccino. You look around, you check your phone, you drink your cappuccino. It's your trusty, delicious cappuccino. Okay. And then, yeah, it's, you know, uh, half an hour is up. It's time for you to leave and uh, you ask for the bill. Yeah. So you look down at the bill and you see the cost of the cappuccino and it comes to $36. US dollars. How would you feel? Where does that possibly come from? You know, did you make it with gold? Uh, no way, James. No way. No way am I paying that at all. <laughs> well, it's funny, I mean, because historically speaking, coffee kind of was that expensive. Yes, it was. I, I was looking at the Amsterdam Coffee Exchange. Mm. One pound of coffee, 1735, would have cost you $13.41. $13.41 yeah. for a pound of green coffee. Yeah. Today, I know the price of coffee is more or less a dollar a pound. More or less a dollar a pound, yeah. And this is what's remarkable. Here we are in the early 1700s paying over $13 for a pound of coffee. You're fast forward 300 years and we're paying, what, a, a dollar more or less for coffee? Yep. So it goes down 13 times in just 300 years. Yeah. And Jonathan, I'm going to argue that one of the most enduring legacies of colonialism is this idea that coffee should be cheap. The idea that we are outraged when we see coffee at $36 for a cappuccino. I would absolutely agree with you. That is the heart of the story of coffee. And it's how coffee became an everyday commodity in a good way and a bad way. And in this episode, we're going to explore how colonialism brought the coffee price down and down and down, much closer to where we are today. And we are going to be looking at who had to suffer and in what ways were they made to suffer in order for Europeans to get cheaper coffee. I think to put it in a nutshell, James, what we're looking at is what is the true cost of that coffee? I'm James Harper, the creator of Filter Stories, a coffee documentary podcast. And I'm Jonathan Morris, Professor of History and author of Coffee, A Global History. And this is A History of Coffee, a six-episode podcast series where Jonathan and I untangle how this small psychoactive seed changed the world and continues to shape our lives today. All right, Jonathan, let's pick up from the last episode. And to do that, I want to quickly tell you about a time when I was in India in 2014 on a motorcycle going from the north to the south. And along the way, I passed these beautiful mountainous tea fields covered in clouds. And the further south I went, the people that I met drank less tea and more coffee. And then at one point, I motorcycled into this region called Baba Budan. And Baba Budan is a person, and he's credited with bringing coffee from Yemen to India. And of course, this is a big deal, because if we remember from the last episode, Yemen controlled the world supply of coffee in the late 1600s. Yep, effectively, as we said, Mocha is the, has the monopoly on coffee. And the Ottoman Empire, who controlled Yemen, yep would dry out the coffee beans so that it was basically impossible to grow coffee outside of Yemen. This was their way of keeping a monopoly. Yeah. But Jonathan, tell me, how did this Baba Budan character actually get the beans out of Yemen? <laughs> 
Babu Dan is a spiritual man, a Muslim, and、uh, he makes pilgrimages, and he makes the pilgrimages to the Holy Land,、uh, which would be Mecca,、yep. modern day Saudi Arabia. So the myth is that Babu Dan smuggles these seedlings out in his clothing, possibly in his turban, possibly in his undergarments, and plants these back in India, and this is how coffee reaches India.、Hmm. I don't think we have any proof of this whatsoever.、Mm. What makes more sense to me、mm-hmm. is I think that this is another attempt by those people who controlled the Indian Ocean trade, those Banyan merchants, Gujarat, the Gujarats, yeah, who to find another place where they can grow coffee.、Mm. So you're saying that Baba Budan. He is another coffee myth. You know, coffee myths and coffee history don't always mix that well. <laughs> It's a lovely myth, but I don't think there is anything that we can realistically back it up with. Okay, so we have a situation now where coffee is growing in India, potentially transported by the dominant trading power at the time, which were the Gujaratis, the Banyans, and、yep. at some point, the Dutch get hold of it. How does that happen, and what do they do with it? Well, so the Dutch get hold of it and take it to Java. For those who are unaware, Java is an island that sits in the middle of the South China Sea in that vast archipelago that is Indonesia. Yeah. You know, obviously, we talk about you know cups of Java. So, is there a link there? Absolutely. So, I mean, this is、uh, something that we see a lot with the first American coffee brands of the late nineteenth century. Will proclaim themselves Java, and hence Java becomes a common term for coffee. There we go. So, Jonathan, when the Dutch brought coffee to Java, were the people of Java happy to receive it? Well, I would highly doubt it. Because it's of no value to them. Okay, why not? The system in Java was that you had villages, and these villages owed tribute to a lord.、Mm-hmm. And what happened was that the Dutch effectively said to that elite, "Well, listen, we will keep you in power,、mm. but what you do is you give us a proportion of revenue or crop that we want."、Mm-hmm. Basically, what happens, therefore, is a village has a certain amount of coffee growing imposed upon it.、Hmm. But I mean, the real issue is that the Dutch want this coffee grown more economically,、mm-hmm. and therefore they push for coffee to be grown or on sort of designated areas where they know it will do well in larger, more extensive systems.、Mm-hmm. And that means that the peasants are effectively forced, for part of their year,、mm-hmm. to go and work on these estates as part of their remissions to their lord. Do we have any idea of what kind of quality of life they had? Yeah, we're talking subsistence farming.、Mm-hmm. But the point is that's why it's so devastating when they're told to do the coffee,、mm. because in effect, it's the coffee takes them away. Both in terms of time, but actually in some cases in terms of distance from the plots that they need to be cultivating in order to generate their own resources. You know, they're like, "Hey, we just want to live our life, grow our food, hang out with our family and friends." Oh, but we have to trudge off for a couple of days. But we have、plot. to do this stuff. Yes, exactly. And they are doing it ultimately because the Dutch are giving some good deals to the local rulers to be like, "Hey, get us this coffee."、We'd、describe it as a little bit of a protection racket, really. Okay. The good deal for the local rulers is the local rulers continue to rule, and they're relatively unthreatened. And in fact, they're backed by now the forces of the Dutch Empire. So this is really the beginnings of coffee becoming a colonial crop. So, I mean, to coin a name that's well known in coffee these days,、mm-hmm. Max Havelar.、Hmm. So, Max Havelar is actually the pseudonym of a Dutch official、mm-hmm. who writes a book, and what he really does is show how the Javanese elite、mm-hmm. are maintained in power while the peasantry starve. 
Oh, wow. And how the Dutch system is complicit in that. And when anyone tries to challenge this, Mm -hmm. then they themselves find themselves ostracized and thrown out essentially of kind of Dutch society. Wow. So it's a very difficult system to challenge. It's just too profitable. It's extremely difficult to challenge. Mm. The Havilar novel is really about the powerlessness even of officials who are enlightened. So even if you're in the system, you can't really change it. So we have Yemen growing coffee, then Java gets added to the mix as two big coffee exporters. And then we have a period of the colonial production of coffee. So yeah. let's freeze frame 1780. Where in the world would coffee be growing? So 1780, dominant area of the world for coffee growing is now the Caribbean. We're looking at Saint-Domingue, which is a French territory. We're looking at Martinique, again French. We're looking at Jamaica, British. And we're looking at Suriname, Dutch. And Cuba, of course, Spanish. Okay. So basically, yeah, a lot of the Caribbean. Yeah. And why is the Caribbean the place for coffee growing at this point in time? I think one reason for that is that the Caribbean area is being used for two crops. Mm -hmm. It's not just coffee. In fact, coffee is not even the dominant crop. The dominant crop is sugar. Oh, The thing about this is that these islands, they have low-lying areas around the coast and then they have much higher areas in the interior. Those areas around the coast are perfect for sugar cane. Uh You know, we talk about the coffee revolution, but the sugar revolution, sugar is so, so desirable. Mm -hmm. And consequently, coffee is the symbiotic crop to sugar. Mm -hmm. Sugar on the low plains, intensive, big plantation farming, Coffee, smaller plantations usually, higher up the mountains. Mm -hmm. And the Caribbean is at the center of the slave trade. That is where Mm -hmm. you can take your slaves, occupy these relatively low population countries, Mm -hmm. and it's relatively easy to trade from the Caribbean. Coffee and sugar, it's such a perfect marriage. It's a perfect marriage unless you're the poor person who has to actually do the uh, work. In which case, it's the perfect nightmare. Okay, so Jonathan, what I want to do now is unpack how the colonial coffee system works. And once we've unpacked that later in the episode, we'll touch on how that translates to lower and lower coffee prices. But to understand why prices fall, we need to understand where people were found in the first place to work for nothing, and how the system controlled them so they continued working for nothing. So let's now talk about the enslaved people. Where were they enslaved? Okay, so nearly all of the people who work in the Caribbean, African origin, they are enslaved, and they're enslaved usually by Africans. Mm -hmm. They were brought usually to the west coast of Africa, and they would be acquired there by Europeans, shipped across the Atlantic, and then sold on to planters in the Caribbean. So, of course, I mean, Europeans are creating the demand for slaves. Yeah. So the the enslavers in Africa are kind of acting on this demand to, to try to find people to meet it. That is true, yes. The real problem is that we had already slave trading going on in Africa. But when you look at West Africa Mm -hmm. and the slave trade to the Atlantic, you're exactly right. The demand creates this massive slaving economy. Could easily be that a third of the people in those areas ended up being enslaved. That is a huge number. It is. I'm imagining a European ship. They've arrived off the west coast of Africa. Yeah. They throw their anchor overboard. They get in their rowboats and kind of get onto the shores of continental Africa. And they ask, we're here to buy slaves. 
they would go on shore, they would probably offload cargo from Europe. The enslaved people are held in buildings that are almost like forts by the coast. They usually hold them in shackles. Uh, those people are then transported by boat out onto the big ships, again shackled, placed in the holds, and they're going to be kept there for the whole of the voyage. Do we have any idea of what the conditions were like on board? One thing about slave ships, James, if you look at the designs of slave ships... Okay, I'm just going to put that into Ecosia now. And actually, ooh, jeez. Right, tell me about this image. So what we have here is a cross-section of La Marine Serafine from 1770. Aha, uh-huh. yeah. And on the bottom deck is a lot of barrels. Then the deck above that is, again, mostly barrels and a bit of food. But then the deck, which is below the main deck, you know, the top deck, it is just like a hundred people just crammed underneath. In fact, there's literally not an inch between them. You know, this image is interesting because this ship, we know that slaver ship because that slaver ship was used for coffee. How many months at sea would you be in these cramped conditions? I think that voyage could probably take up to three months. Where would you go to the bathroom? What would happen if you got sick? Okay, where would you go to the bathroom where you were chained in all probability? What would happen if you got sick? You might well be disposed of because you're no value. A sick human is like a sick animal on a farm. You know, it's, it's no longer useful. If you die, you're over the side. If you become a danger, you're over the side. We have to understand, James, they're not treated or regarded as people. Mm. They're regarded as a commodity. Mm -hmm. And then this ship here, La Marie Serafine, where would it have sailed into? If you look at the image. All right, so Jonathan, you sent me an image here. And I see this giant classic 17th century ship with, you know, sails and masts. And in the background is this beautiful island, big mountains, kind of rising out of the ocean. Yeah, that's Saint-Domingue. So what is Saint-Domingue? What is that today? So that today is Haiti. Haiti, okay. What you're seeing there, James, the ship's arrived, it's thrown down its anchor, and it's now auctioning off its slaves. Mm -hmm. But it's quite an event. Mm. So you look at the back of the ship, the stern, Mm -hmm. you see there's a white canopy, yeah? Yeah. And under the canopy are people seating, having a picnic. These are the settlers who are there, their families. It's a big day. You know, they're having their picnic. In the middle, where you saw those enslaved people, that's where they're being held. You'll see there's a big, giant iron screen that's stopping them getting onto the back. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And on the front end of the ship, the quarter deck, they're actually auctioning. Wow. So the serious auctioning is going on there. This is such a surreal image. Yeah, exactly. It, 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 it's, it's, it's madness. I mean, you have people having tea and crumpets and goodness knows what under this beautiful white canopy, these Europeans. Well, I'm going to guess they were having coffee, actually, but yes. And they're overseeing these enslaved Africans who, heaven knows how they survived that journey in these horrific circumstances, you know, kept in the bowels of a ship for three months. Yeah. As if, oh, it's just a lovely day out. Oh, they're being auctioned off. Of course, you know, we're selling the goods that we brought. Isn't everything great? Yeah, that's exactly it. That is the celebration. We're selling the goods off at the end of the voyage. Celebration times. And I mean, I should say, you know, the buying of the slaves. Well, it's described in this book by a guy called PJ Labori. Okay. It is like a technical manual how to farm coffee. But of course, the process involves mm-hmm. slaves. Mm-hmm. And he has a whole section on how you handle these slaves. And it is the same technical detail as the rest of the book. It's like livestock. 
And so he says, you know, you go down when you buy a slave, what are you looking for? You're looking for kind of a lustrous skin color. You're looking at the teeth. Do they have the muscles in the right places? You want to buy them young. You want to buy them sort of, you know, 14, 15, so that you can mold them to the master's opinion. That's the exact words he uses. Psychological control. Yeah, exactly. And he then describes, you know, what you have to do when you get them. Oh, well, then you basically make them drink sudorific potions. Mm -hmm. What this means is you've got to get these people who've endured that voyage. You're now going to make them sweat and vomit for two weeks. Because you want to get rid of anything they picked up during the voyage. (laughs) So you actually get them to drink seawater and salt water to raise the temperature, to make them sweat and vomit unimaginable and um then you have to do what he describes the unfortunate but necessary act of branding them oh and this is goes in detail this book is detailing all of this this book details all of this in the same way as elsewhere it details the process by which washed coffee is produced in the sense of using, you know, water channels to uh, convey the coffee and get it through graters and so forth. But the whole thing is in the same tone. It's a whole section on whips. Hmm. You know, here's the different knots that you use in your whips. Mm -hmm. You know, how to clean your whip. You must clean your knots. You must clean between whippings because, you know, you can't afford to transfer infection. (laughs) <laughs> this is torture this is this is just torture i found this so difficult to read when i was researching it Okay, so we've heard about the French and how they created these manuals for essentially enslaving people and putting them to work. What were the Dutch doing? We know the Dutch were over in Indonesia, you know, working with local rulers, outsourcing their dirty work to get coffee. Yes. And I know they were in Suriname. You hear Suriname and I think, where on earth is that? Somewhere in the Caribbean, but can you place it for me geographically? If you think of the continent that we call South America, if you think on the kind of the northeast side of that, Suriname is quite small. Yeah, in fact, I'm putting it into Ecosia now. It's kind of like this little tiny state, you know, clinging onto the side of the coast, sandwiched between Venezuela and Brazil. Exactly. So how were the Dutch growing coffee in Suriname? This is the big shift for the Dutch, because Suriname is straightforward slave plantation. Right. Do we have any evidence as to what conditions the enslaved people were put to work? There's a fantastic image in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, which you can freely access, which is of a plantation called something like Leuvepool. Yeah, so Jonathan, you have sent me an image. It is extraordinary. It's like, imagine if a drone took off from the shores of a river right up into the air and like stared into a forest. But instead of seeing, you know, miles and miles of forest, you saw these lines, rows of perfectly positioned coffee trees, row after row after row, and it cuts right into the forest, like with a scalpel. Yeah. And the first thing that hits me is just how large this is. There must be, who knows? I mean, look, 50 football fields worth of coffee growing here? It looks like that, doesn't it? I mean, this is land that's basically been carved out from wildland and colonized with coffee. Then I zoom in. The first thing you notice, there is like dark brown houses and white houses. You have black enslaved Africans not wearing very much. And you have white Europeans, you know, in all their 17th century birches and hats and, you know, coattails and all that kind of thing with guns. Yes. You see there absolutely reproduce the divides within the whole of the plantation system. And you can almost read it from left to right. So the brown houses Mm -hmm. that you see, they're kind of like a three-sided quadrangle, aren't they? Mm -hmm. That's your slave housing. Mm -hmm. 
the middle of your picture, you see all the processing going on. Mm -hmm. You see people working the patios. And there they're drying the coffee, you know, taking the coffee cherry and putting it under the sun so you can then husk it out later to get the coffee bean. Exactly right. Yes. Natural processing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as we go over towards the right hand side, we see what's labeled, you know, housing for whites. If you look at the key in, to the original picture. Oh, yeah, because every building's labeled. Everything is labeled. Yeah. Wow. And, you know, the white housing, it looks like a Pennsylvania farmstead. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's that kind of architecture. That is, you know, the Dutch style, is it not? Mm. But what a contrast with, look over to the left, that looks like a prison, yeah? Yeah. Jonathan, do we have an idea of how tough things were? Like how many people died? There was a historian of Suriname, James, who said that Suriname was probably the place where man's inhumanity to man reached its zenith. Now that gives you a sense of how tough it was. I mean, really tough. So we don't have fantastic figures in terms of working that out, but I'd like to mm. just tell you a couple of things. Uh -huh. 1738, there's a Dutch West India Company slave ship. It's called the Loisden. And that has about 700 enslaved Africans. It's carrying them mm -hmm. through Suriname, on the big rivers through Suriname, mm -hmm. to go to the plantations. They get caught up in a storm. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that the captain tells the crew mm -hmm. to shut the hold, to lock all of those enslaved people into the hold mm -hmm. so that they won't get onto the lifeboats because he wants to make sure that they, the crew, get the lifeboats, okay? Uh-huh. 664 people die, suffocate, drown Jeez. as the boat sinks. The crew, of course, escape. That's the way that people thought about enslaved people. You know, looking at this image of the slave plantation in Suriname, one thing that strikes me is how it seems really unbalanced in the sense that I can count dozens and dozens of black enslaved Africans. Yeah. And, I don't know, a handful of white Europeans. What is stopping people from just rising up and, and getting rid of their oppressors? The shorter answer would be, I mean, there is a system of enforcement that is carried out through a bunch of both white and then black overseers of various kinds. So you have the slave driver is, of course, a slave himself who will be given extra rations, incentives, etc. to perform their role. Oh, wow. So you have a system in which, in effect, people are coerced into collaboration. Mm -hmm. If I can make a parallel, because if we think about Saint-Domingue, you know, the punishments in Saint-Domingue, in theory, these were regulated. You weren't allowed to do certain things to your slave by a so-called black code, code for blacks. Oh, interesting. But, you know, you could hit them, you could whip them. That was fine. You couldn't theoretically kill them, but you could can them and pay a fee to the justices to do that for you. So, so your slave has transmitted a major transgression. Right. A lot of slaves were accused of things like poisoning, which are extremely vague. Mm-hmm. Now, if you consign your slaves to a court system in a country that's dominated basically by your colonial power, you pretty much know you'll get the outcome you're after. Right. And you have to pay a fee for the punishment that has to be meted out. So punishment of execution costs a certain amount. Huh. And you pay the fee for it. As the enslaver. As the enslaver. Okay, hold on. Doesn't the state have to pay for executions? No, this is it. The state is charging you the fee for executing. Again, you know, your point about why do people not rise up? Mm. Well, one reason is because they're intimidated. One way of, you know, intimidating them is to hold these punishments very publicly. Mm. It's intended far beyond the getting rid of somebody troublesome. It's intending to sear a message into the minds of people in the system that you don't rebel. Mm. 
So Jonathan, we've looked at how coffee was grown in Yemen in the last episode. You know, small little farmers growing coffee on a mountain, not being forced to grow by anybody, not being forced to sell by anybody. And in this episode, we explored the system in Java, where the Dutch use local rulers to produce coffee. Indentured laborers, as you say, essentially working to produce fixed quotas that have been imposed on them by their lords. And we've also explored in depth Suriname, where the Dutch ran the slave plantations themselves. Labor costs zero. Incentive, avoid the whip. What did this all do to the price of coffee and how much coffee was coming into Europe? I'm going to take you for two dates, 1735 and then 25 years later, 1760. And this is significant because in this time period, Yemen fades as a coffee growing region and Java and Suriname start producing a lot, lot more. 1735, and we talked about it with our expensive cappuccino. Mm. 1735, coffee from Yemen coming in at thirteen forty one, $13.41 <laughs> per pound in today's money. Right. Java is at $9.24. Okay, so it's about a third cheaper than Yemen? Suriname at $8.26. So slightly cheaper still. Now, in 1760, Yemen's dropped a bit. It's $12.80. Suriname has dropped to $5.01. Okay, wow. so that is a huge difference. And when the price of Suriname coffee is this cheap, who's producing more coffee overall? Is it Java or Suriname? So Suriname is producing the most coffee mm. at the cheapest price. And so the story for me here is the system where people suffer the most, which is the Suriname system. Yeah. It manages to produce the most coffee, get it the most cheaply. Yes. But that is exactly the price of the suffering. So coffee is now getting down to $5 a pound. And Jonathan, now this is the point where I want to explore how does cheaper coffee begin to affect European culture? Well, I've sent you two images from Paris, okay? Okay. We've got one image, which is of the patrons of the Café Procop from the 1700s. <laughs> this, Tell me what you think of those people. You, you know those reenactments of the signing of the Declaration of Independence? It looks just like that. A lot of men, a lot of wigs. A lot of white stockings, all sat round and talking politics and drinking in a very ornate establishment. Men and wigs. That's what we're talking <laughs> here. The Café Bricrop is a place where high society goes. So we're talking about the late 17th century, early 18th century. So at this point, yeah. coffee from the port of Mocha, as in Yemen, would have been the coffee they would be drinking. Yes, absolutely. Right. This is before, you know, slave plantations were a thing. Yes. So wealthy people drinking a very expensive product. Refined product, refined surroundings. Gotcha. So you sent me this other image. This is a woman. She looks like an old Italian grandmother sitting in the piazza in her work clothes. She's got a cloth around her head, a dirty apron, and she's pouring a bit of milk and coffee into a bowl with like a bread basket next to her. So she is selling cafe au lait on the street to anyone who'll buy it. Oh, wow. And so I'm making the contrast, James, because, you know, that's the 100 years right there. Jeez. The 100 years from coffee breaking out from Yemen, being produced in the Caribbean, and becoming a mass good, basically, being sold on the streets. This is coffee when it goes from a luxury to an affordable luxury. Exactly. So Jonathan, remember how outraged you were when you got that bill for a cappuccino that cost $36? Oh yes, I certainly do. 
I think that outrage comes from the fact that, for hundreds of years, coffee has remained a daily affordable luxury. It was a daily affordable luxury for my mom. The same for my mom's father. The same for his grandfather. The same for my great, 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 great grandfather. And I have a memory of my Italian mom making coffee on the stovetop in a bialetti. For me, that's a beautiful memory. She has a memory of her father sipping an espresso in an Italian coffee bar. Yeah, that's interesting, James, because I could say the same for my family. You know, on dinner parties when they had people over, I remember my mum had a fake gold tray and she'd bring that out and we had the coffee percolator on it and the coffee percolator go ch you know, and put the coffees into the cups, pour them in very delicately. But Jonathan, that's why I think you, at the beginning of the episode, feel outraged when coffee goes back to the price it originally was. You know, back in the time of the early 17th century with the French and the Café Procop of the wigs and the stockings. An expensive, exclusive product that you would enjoy very, very occasionally. So it starts to not become a part of your life, your mother's life, your mother's mother's life anymore. It becomes something exclusive. And we react emotionally to that. Yeah, I'm with you on that, James. But it was the suffering of human beings that brought coffee into our daily lives and help shape our identity. That is what value chains are all about. If you have to drive down value at one end, then you really have to drive it down at the other. And that's what they've done. So Jonathan, early 1700s, coffee from Yemen coming in at about $13.50. You fast forward 30 years. Coffee is produced in a slave system in Suriname, and it's about $5 a pound. And if you fast forward another 100 years to like, you know, the middle of the 1800s, what does the coffee price become? At that time, it's down to around $2 a pound. So what happens to get the coffee price from about $5 down to $2 a pound in 100 years? Are we making even more slave plantations and making them even more horrific? We are making many more coffee plantations, some of which are staffed by slave labor. But we're also just seeing a massive expansion in the production of coffee, but a shift in where that coffee is being produced. So by the 1900s, The vast majority, so 90% of the world's coffee is being produced in Latin America. And of that, the overwhelming majority is being produced by one single country. And that country is Brazil. So Jonathan, what is the story we're going to be exploring in the next episode? The transformation of coffee from a colonial good to what I would call an industrial product. And above all, what we're seeing from that is the effect of scale. We're going to see the way that coffee farming becomes hugely increased, both in a volume, but also in the size of the coffee farms. We're going to see the ways in which the market for coffee is massively increased in particularly the United States. But above all, we're going to see that there's another side to that story. What's destroyed in that story? the environmental costs that enable us to get that price down once more. So thank you for listening to the second episode of A History of Coffee. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope it wasn't too dark for you. Now, if you're listening to this on the Filter Stories channel, you might not see episodes three or four, but they are out right now. And you can binge them all on the A History of Coffee podcast channel.
There's a link in the show notes. And also there, of course, is a link to my book, Coffee, A Global History, which goes into more detail about these stories. And Jonathan, you know, this episode was created out of, heaven knows, five hours of conversations between us. And one thing I really wanted to cover, but I couldn't find a place for it in the episode, was the British. But we're here now. So tell me, what did they do? The British took the island of Ceylon, which is today uh, known as Sri Lanka, mm. and filled it with coffee farms. Mm. And it wasn't a nice story. Mm. A lot of people, one way or another, died. Wow. I've also heard a statistic that at one point, Sri Lanka, back in the 19th century, was the largest coffee producer in the world. Yeah, there is a point in the 1860s that Sri Lanka is actually the leading coffee producer in the world. And what's kind of extraordinary to me is that, I mean, have you ever had a Sri Lankan coffee? I've never knowingly had a coffee from Sri Lanka, James. Yeah, me neither. So, Jonathan, you and I, we're going to be hopping on an Instagram live session where we will be talking about the British in Sri Lanka and how coffee got there, how it became so popular, why so many people died in the production of this coffee, and ultimately why coffee left Sri Lanka. It's one of those stories of coffee that's not well known at all, and yet it actually is a, a really compelling and important element of coffee's history. And if you want to follow that, then follow me on Instagram. I'm at Filter Stories Podcast. And Jonathan? I am at Coffee History JM. And we'll be doing that Instagram live show in the next couple of weeks. So keep an eye out on Instagram. This podcast was produced by myself and Jonathan. And I wrote and played the piano music that you're listening to. Please do go and help others find this show by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or just tell them over a cup of coffee. Thanks so much. And Jonathan, I'll speak to you and I'll speak to you, dear listener, in the next episode. I'm looking forward to it already, James.